Hey, everybody. My name is Joe Piverunas. I'm the founder and managing editor of Nanalyze. We're a boutique media and research firm that covers disruptive tech for a broad audience of investors around the world, including retail investors and institutional investors. Today, we're going to talk about a company called D-Wave. They're involved in quantum computing, and they've recently decided to go public using a SPAC. We're going to talk about why that's a letdown. And the short story is that D-Way was founded in 1999 and was probably the most prominent quantum computing company since we started covering this topic. So back in the day, there were few companies involved in quantum computing, and D-Wave came along and said that they're the first quantum computing company, which gives them a bit of a head start. And they developed a prototype back in 2007. They announced the world's first commercially available quantum computer in 2011, so that's over a decade ago. And then they began selling computers. That first computer they developed was 128 qubits. The one they developed in 2017 and started selling was 2000, and more recently in 2019, a 5000 qubit quantum computer. Now, we're not going to get into the technical terms. Looking at comparing companies by looking at the number of qubits they have is really apples and oranges because it comes down to error correction. But this presentation isn't about quantum computing and whether or not D-Wave is the leader and what they do. It's going to be talking about why the company hasn't made traction over the years. So we've been following them rather frequently over the years. And that started with a piece where we looked at how you might be able to get exposure to their shares. If you'll recall, there was a company, a publicly traded VC company called Tiny back in the day. They were relating to nanotechnology. And you could buy shares of Tiny and get some incidental exposure to D-Wave. And then we looked at some other ways that you could get exposure. There was a fund that held some shares. And then we continued to touch on the company over the years. And now that they're going to become publicly traded, we reckon there's going to be some interest in it. So when we took a look at the SPAC deck, it was a real letdown, starting with this slide, which shows us the expected revenues for 2022. But they also, also give us percent growth. And you can see that the expected revenue of 11 million is 119% more than it was the prior year. So we can back that out and see that the prior year's revenues were probably around $5 million. Now, for a company that's been dabbling in quantum computing for such a long time, that's quite a small number. And when we look at the notes where the management team presented the investor deck, they break down the $5 million in 2021 revenues into two categories. Half would be professional services, half is platform as a service. Now, since they didn't explicitly say what their 2021 revenues were, they simply made the statement that 50% were services and 50% were their platform as a service. We're only assuming that breakdown extends to the year prior in addition to their forecast. So the component here we're interested in is the platform as a service, similar to software as a service where companies pay to access the platform by the number of cycles they're running. So that's the component we're interested in, but let's start by looking at professional services. They detail this pretty specifically in their notes, and we found that a bit odd that it just seemed rather convenient that the onboarding time would be have the exact same terms for every client, last one year, and total $750,000. But it does make sense. So this is how you might go about selling something like this to a client. You have a two-month engagement, so you understand their needs, which applications they can use that most benefit from quantum computing. Then you'd build out a proof of concept, and that's another five months, and then um, another five months for doing a pilot deployment. deployment. And after all that, the client has given you $750,000, a year has passed, and then they move on to the platform as a service component, which the company says involves between 500,000 and a million dollars per year per application per client. So we can do some very simple back the napkin math. Let's assume that they're charging the lowest price possible. 
And let's also assume that every customer only has one application. So perhaps the worst case scenario if you're a sales manager. With these assumptions and the previously stated $5 million in 2020 revenues, we can split that in half and see that the $2.5 million at most would account for five customers, $500,000 being the least amount of money that a customer would pay and 2.5 million being the total they received in 2020. That's pretty low. If we look at the forecast for 2021, that uh, last line on this slide is incorrect. That should say 2021. Then we can assume 11 customers. These are very small numbers. Why? Here's some, a couple excerpts that we took from the press release announcing the SPAC. So and our, our um, highlights here are in red. D-Wave has, who says they have, 25 of the Forbes Global 2000 companies, including some big names. And of course, they've given some use cases that sound great uh, on how these customers are using their platform to realize efficiencies. And that's all dandy, but how can they have these 25 large companies and then at the same time say that they've only realized the small amount of revenues that they have. And this, the bottom of this slide, you can see a little clip we took from this back deck that says they have over a hundred customers. And the second statement, thousands of developers across the globe have built hundreds of early quantum applications. Well, that's great. Are they giving you any money for this stuff? Are they kicking the tires? Is it failing through the professional services onboarding phase? What's going on here? So, this doesn't make sense. Things don't add up. And we're very curious as to why that is the case. And if we go back to this previous slide, if we don't assume minimums here, it seems likely that they have some customers that represent a high concentration risk. So it's not equally spread out. And in order to determine whether that's the case, we need to see SEC filings. Until we do, there's nothing more to investigate here. But initially, it's a letdown. This is not impressive based on the numbers we've been given at all for the world's oldest quantum computing company that we've been watching and excited about now for over a decade. Now, there's one point we wanted to make about software versus hardware, and it really comes down to it doesn't matter if you're developing either. What matters is that you've built something that your customers want to pay for. And we were in Vancouver several years ago, speaking with a company called OneCubit that, well, we don't know their revenues, um, claims to have um, a fair number of commercial clients that are paying them for access to their software, which is platform agnostic. And the gentleman there who we interviewed gave us the example of a top researcher at Microsoft who using software only took a problem that would take 30,000 years to solve, and then solved it in 30 years with a new algorithm, and then most recently solved the same problem in minutes. So going back to Andreessen's comment about software eating the world, and you look at companies like DeepMind that are using AlphaFold and AI to figure out how proteins are folded, then that's what we're interested in is the outcome. And we don't really care if that's a quantum computer or quantum software or any sort of a platform, as long as it's able to solve problems that customers are willing to pay money for. Now, we've are leading, this is leading us to believe that first is not always best. Um, D-Wave may be the first quantum computing company, but many others have followed. We've, um, we'll look at that in a second, looked at a, a, quite a number of companies in addition to the large tech giants that are making progress, or so they say, in quantum computing or quantum computing software. And when it comes to the three companies now that are uh, that have either planned a spec or completed their spec, in the case of IonQ, the the latter being a company that's quite hyped, these none of these firms are realizing meaningful revenues, which we would consider to be ten million dollars a year or more. What? investors need to consider also is the work that the world's biggest tech companies have been doing in quantum computing 
And of course, what Rumsfeld referred to as unknown unknowns, things that we just can't possibly know about. If you look at firms like Microsoft, Honeywell's recent spin out, you've got IBM, though they're probably not doing anything, they never are. And then you've got Google, which interestingly enough, Google was a client of D-Waves back in 2009, and then Google seems to be doing their own development. So one wonders about that, but we've also listed here um, a number of, certainly not a comprehensive list, a number of um, startups involved in quantum computing software and hardware. And even more recently, this is a list of quantum newcomers. I think we took this from firms that had taken funding last year that are involved in some aspect of quantum computing. So the conclusion here, when it comes to D-Wave, first of all, wait for the merger to complete. We don't know that it will complete. SPAC deals are now falling through as Wall Street realizes what we've said from the beginning that SPACs don't benefit retail investors. Once D-Wave completes their merger, we can then examine their regulatory filing documents and have a look to see what's actually going on. Some of the things we want to look for are customer concentration risk, as we talked about before. And of course, their ability to hit that $11 million estimate for 2022. So if they actually do that, there's no reason to think that they wouldn't, then it certainly merits another look because now they have meaningful revenues. And then we'd want to know about, well, where are those revenues coming from and the like. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you would, just put comments or questions in the comment section of this YouTube video, and we will promptly respond to them. So thank you so much for your time.